Hey, what's up? My name is RJ Kyler, and this is the Permanent Rain Press. Hi, everyone. It's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press. Today, I am so happy to be joined by RJ Kyler. How's it going? Oh, it's really good. You know, uh, look, it's it's cooler out in California. What we had like a heat wave, like two weeks in a row. It was really hot, so now it's starting to cool down. Uh, just left the gym. I can actually be outside out of the heat now, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, without having to worry about heat stroke or anything like that. So happy to hear yeah. it. I know we're shifting into fall, and you've been really busy as of late. Uh, I know a show of yours, Rap Shit, just got renewed for a second season. So we won't yeah. get too, too much into that, but I am glad to see that you're staying creative, a lot of cool characters you've been playing. And mainly we are here today to chat about a film that you did in 2019, but it's been doing the festival circuit, Freedom's Path, which you both yeah. star in and executive produce. So how did you come to be a part of this project? and and you know what drew you to the story? Um, my team, um, Nick Diamandi and uh, and in um, Kendall Park, right? They always had a very good eye for kind of what I could fit into in the sleeve. So Nick sent me the script, and it was it was perfect. You know, it's uh, it's almost like it didn't need any turns, twists, and this was also the first time that I had read a script. Um, like this in throughout my entire reading process of the script, I wasn't offended. You feel me? Oh, I didn't feel like they were reaching for the tear or, you know, uh, doing too much to kind of cause um, friction between two groups to kind of feed off of the toxicity that we like as humans, you know, um, but it was pure. That's what made me really, really attached to the script in the way of just, okay, I want to be attached to it. I want to do whatever I can for it, whatever type of baby you want this to become, <laughs> Brett, you know, um, because it, it just read a pure natured relationship between two people. Of course, they're from different sides, right? You have a young African-American man, you have a young Caucasian man. Of course, they are in a war at the time, so they would not so-called find a relationship to even be with each other outside of fighting, right? But to see that they were given the opportunity to kind of readjust their thinking processes through each other, you know, just throughout the whole film, like Kitch and William, they, they find this love romance, you know, um, and then nowhere near supposed to uh, from what people's, you, you know, thoughts would be. But that pureness of brotherhood that's just kind of grasped out of thin air, you feel me? I was able to be in a place of nostalgia because that's literally how men grow relationships and friendships between each other anyway. So to just, you know, um, depict great energy and also a brotherhood and love between each other, but also a great message of bonding right that that kind of just reads and dances across the script in such a poetic way to kind of meet brett then maybe give more into it because he's such a flower of a person and so then you know i started to build kitchen and kitchen came to life <laughs> you know what kind of research or preparation did you do from for Kitch Kitchen? Because I know that this was um, based off Brett's short film in 2015, but I mm. imagine you kind of fleshed out this character more. So was there source material or existing films and characters that you took inspiration from? Y yeah, I, I think um, the power of abundance, right? Uh, that you're kind of given in, in roles like this, you kind of get a big ass, oh, excuse me, a big plethora of things to, to feed from, you know? So with Kitsch, it was more of like my traumatic experiences, being able to kind of be let out through something that I've never experienced before. You know, I've been oppressed before, of course, I've been abused before and all of these things, but I've never been able to emote these things, you know? So when it came to Kitch, Kitch had so many things that happened to him as a young one that I was like, whoa, this kid has a lot <laughs> that you can kind of feed off of. Like he has trauma there, there's pain there, there's love, there's cries, there's, you know, all of these things. And it's, it's almost like you get to choose which highway to make Kitch, but Kitch reads very powerful. He doesn't seem subservient at all. He never has a point of, of 
weakness, but he has a lot of points of vulnerability, you know? Um, and that's something that a lot of people kind of dismiss, like, no, he's not weak at all. Okay, cool, but is he vulnerable? You know, that's kind of where the power punch and kitsch comes from because his vulnerability is there throughout the entire film. You know, whether that is him being vulnerable enough to let you know he doesn't like you or vulnerable enough to let you know this hurts or this scares me or I still think about these things. So when it came to what I could give to Kitsch, it was like, OK, RJ, what is in your therapeutic, you know, wheelhouse to give to this character, you know? And so a lot of that just started to pour from my personal life experiences like, dang, I didn't get to cry about that. All right, word. Well, this is kind of the instant like. Oh, wow. Okay, let me give that to William, you know, and Garen being such a great and amazing scene partner, just friend in general, he allowed for me to give him all that I needed to and for him to do the same, you know, and give to me. So then Kitsch just became this, like, person of chances in my head to, to where I could give the rawness of it rather than just the spectacle version of what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of give across and so like, different, different, I guess you could say eh, nuances of RJ made kitsch, you feel me? Um, and then when it came to just how I carried myself, um, um, Jamie Foxx's rendition of Django is just amazing to where even in his, in his subservient um, times in the film, right, you still seen that he had a plan of power in his mental space, like he, he he knew that his situation was, all he needed was a little chance, right, to then change something. Um, and that's kind of what Kitsch kind of carries throughout the whole film is just that power, but he doesn't have to find it. He was born with it, you know. It was so interesting to hear your thought process. And I like that you were able to, to tap into maybe these not so great experiences, but it all lends itself well to, to Kitch and his emotions. Now, he does mention that he never knew his mama, Abner, found him when he was going north. Did you personally kind of form a backstory for what happened to his family and how he initially ended up in slavery and on the run? I think, well, I started, um, one thing that that I, I gave to Kitsch was the problem of abandonment, you know, and so when it came to Kitsch not knowing his mama, it's one of those things of, in the time that Kitsch was born, once he was born, he was taken in the way of just selling because that's where his, you know, that's where the times were, you feel me? So Kitsch was a fresh born, you know, sold slave baby. And so that want and yearn for a mother figure, I had seen examples of it around me. You know, I've, I'd seen, um, you know, kids be loved by, you know, other mothers that are in, in the plantation he used to be a part of as a child, right? But to have that motherly hold and bond he didn't have, but also when it came to the fatherly bond or the understanding of it, most of that came from his master. So he didn't know what actual love was from another person, you know? Um, and so when it came to Abner and it came to Caddy, it was like, hey, the, I'm, I'm new to this, but I like this. This is where, okay, now I want to protect this. You know, that's why Kitch is like the warrior of the family, even though Abner is the man of the house because Kitch took a certain protection clause to be like, okay, I have to protect these two because they've shown me a different way of living, not even just a way of surviving or existing, but a way of living in order to give. And that's kind of what you see through his relationship with William, you know? And do you think that it was Caddy and Abner that kind of instilled that role of faith in his life as well? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. I think I think when Kitch first ran, right, he was running in a sense of survival. So even just the attachment to him in the next world, right? Or even just the faith in what it was to be happy or whatever, right? That was built through Abner and Caddy. You know, um, I think that's why the, the protection of them was so important was because he felt like if he ever lost them or if anything ever happened to them, he would lose such a great part of Kitch because he wouldn't have the guidance in ways in which to go to, you know, like um, in the movie, um, Caddy gets at Kitchen, right? And it seems like she hurts his feelings, but she's giving him a part of what it is to be considerate, you know, um, about other people. Even though she's lacking a few information parts or she doesn't know the full story, she's giving Kitchen another piece of what it is to be 
you know, considerate. I'm giving you this vulnerable space. I'm giving you this. Watch what you say out your mouth because you could be this today, but here tomorrow. So what you know is, and all of those building blocks you kind of get to see a lot of the way that Abner carries himself. Kitch carries himself also. You know, he doesn't want to say many words. It doesn't need to say many words. You know, it's just like what I say. I'm a man of my word, and I step by that power, and that's what he got from. Abner, you know, before it was survival, then it became something of honor, humbleness, love, faith, you know, yeah. It was so interesting to see the dynamics between their relationship. And I know it happens at a set point in time, but you can kind of see those lessons woven into who who Kitch has become. You did mention working closely with, with Garen Howell, who stars as William. Now, did the two of you, I know you talked about giving each other, you know, what you could take to, to find your characters, but did the two of you also discuss a lot behind the scenes, those dynamics and how they would build their relationship? Well, yeah, yeah, we definitely had um, conversations about where, uh, not just where our relationship is at the time of whatever scene, right, but how how fast are we allowing for, you know, um, this to develop, because it has to be organic, because we didn't shoot chronologically, right, so it was like, okay, here we have to discuss where we are, because first day of filming, right, we, we, we're not going to be in a space of knowing everybody and knowing all the pieces, but we have to have that communication to trust each other, you know, to kind of go there. Um, and so the, the conversations were very simple, but they were definitely necessary. Like, all right, cool. This is what you need. All right, word. But it's kind of uh, all on the page, really. So too much conversation about what is needed isn't really required, but how to deliver certain things with each other. That was definitely something um, we had talked about you know when you're not kind of in the mindset of your characters what was it like working with Garen because I just love the two of you you mentioned the word bro earlier so this is obviously a period when that term was not used but yeah. just seeing like the the relationship build I'd love to hear about what it was like behind the scenes it was so cool it was like having a brother for real for real that was on set like uh, when you film movies you actually build families and so when when it comes to me and Garen, it's like, it's just us two and we can do that thing now, <laughs> you know, uh, from the from the cold nights or whatever to, you know, hot days or the muddy this, the rainy that, it's like the snowy such, it's like, oh man, it might be freaky. But in, I guess you could say in, in where we were shooting, right? It wasn't too much to do because we're in Arkansas, it's not like, a big city mecca you know but we were in uh, a college part of the town so it was like okay cool there's like bars here um it's really nice like a train station sit out like it's almost like silver lake but everywhere um and so we would you know hanging stuff like that or when we just on set we would just have like bro type of convos you know because he, he's just that laid back of an individual so then when you kind of I guess you could say have these long shoot days and such, you, you feel me? But Garen is never like um, antsy. So it kind of brings you down sometimes when it's like, all right, word, why am I so angst? It's like, I don't know, RJ. I'm not really sure. You might just need to breathe a little bit. It's all right. <laughs> you know, like, and just to, to that that's the, the bromance part of the friendship because it's like, hey, man, I got you, you got me. We both had to carry each other physically in this film, you know, like lift you. I'm way bigger than Garen, you know, but Garen picked me up and carried me without a problem, you know? And it's like, yeah, my brother got me. He ain't gonna drop me. I got you too, bro. You know, it's like, yeah. Uh, and you have to build that type of fun relationship with castmates. That's how you get the chemistry on screen. You know, some people ask, how did you build the chemistry? Literally hang out with each other, you know, <laughs> like, let each other see your weirdness. Like, oh yeah, I do these weird quirky things and such, but then you trust them enough to be, you know, in the scene with, and I have to apologize to yourself because you feel like, oh, well, I feel this way. Like, no, I trust you, bro. You know? It seems like a secret, but you're saying it's really not. You just have to kind of be open with each other yeah, and trust yeah. each other. Uh, you did mention Northwest Arkansas, which is where you filmed this. And it wasn't some of the areas where the Civil War actually took place. So did being in this space kind of heighten those emotions and the significance of the story? Oh, it definitely did. It definitely did. I, I remember like vividly times where I would just have to 
take a, a, a breath, you know, where we were filming and just kind of give gratitude, not even in a space of sadness or sorrow, but in a space of gratitude, you know, for the ones that came before me that at the time of them standing on the same land that I'm standing on, right, it was turmoil and it was, you know, it, it was actually in the toxicity of their life space, but now I get to pay homage to the events that happened under my feet, you know, and I get to to tell a different story of it. I get to give pureness to it. I get to uh, make these events a part of now my history, you know, so it's it felt really, really good and also puts that, you know, extra, I guess you could say, kick in your, in your fanny when you kind of getting a little low in energy. It's like, all right, word, I'm doing this for something rather than for me to just make a spectacle, you know. And for Brett, this was a 12 year journey between conceptualizing, funding, making this film. Is this drive and dedication something that you felt strongly in your interactions with him and then during set, during filming? Oh yeah, yeah. Me and Brett's first conversation, um, it's almost like he, his excitement of this film, right? It's just like a kid who's not just in a candy store, but this is a candy store with toys and a whole bunch of lights that you can just grab from, you feel me? And usually when you got somebody with a, a, a project that, that is that close to them, right? Sometimes they can be very, you know, like nervous about it. But Brett was more excited to give it to somebody to bring to life, you know? And for me to see that he trusts me that much with the character already showed me that he had done the work at home, you know? And so when we got to set, I was that much more willing to make every single one of his director dreams come true. You know, like I'm I'm a director's actor in the, the sense of, I know that you're just a child on the inside that is in the bigger thing of an adult, you know, shell, which I know I am. I'm still little baby RJ that wants his dreams to be boom and bang, you know? And when it comes to directors, it's like, I know that sometimes they aren't um, given the tools to make their, you know, the, the dreams blossom and bloom. And I'm like, I, I totally get that. But Brett, this ain't a film that you're going to have to like lack or lose. Like, I'm going to give you everything I got and then plus 10 more percent because I like you, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and the same amount of work and push and things of that nature that I put in, Brett multiplied and did that by 20,000. So the, the little that I did, you know, it could only support the big nature of what it is Brett put in when it comes to energy funding and things of that nature. I just want to be, you know, a part of how your dreams come true, bro, because you deserve it. You know, like that, that, that's one of those things. I know we all get kind of caught up in the fastness or the bigness of a project, but this project was a very low budget project that we made into something that will literally be monumental for generations to come. And that came out of Brett's mind space literally Brett did this <laughs> you know now we get gold you also got to star opposite the incomparable late Carol Sutton and Thomas Jefferson Bird mm -hmm. as Caddy and Abner so to be in their presence what did you learn from watching them work and just about Carol and Thomas's people so Carol and Thomas first of all are two of the biggest sweethearts that I know um and they remind me so much of my family members that they kind of latched on to me really quickly. Like the first, and Thomas, Thomas is literally one of the most stylish fellas that I've ever seen in my life. And it makes sense because almost every day he wore a little something different that would be like real stylish. But then I remember he wore like a full long coat with the top. Ooh, Thomas was bad. You know, he like, so much swag, but also he's such a sweetheart when he opens and speaks to you and in his words, he makes you kind of sit back and not even think or analyze. You just get to calm and like not have to overindulge in what your own thought space is. It's like you want to listen, but the same thing with Carol, it's like that sweet mama right there. You know, I even called my mom, I was like, mama, listen, Carol, <laughs> That's my mama. Okay. So when you meet her, don't get don't get confused when I say mama, you know. Um they, they just used to keep the energy really alive on set, even though they used to say some of the simplest things, you know, Carol and Thomas were both good with, you know, Peyton. Peyton was my little brother in the movie and Peyton was so energetic. And sometimes Thomas would just be like, hey, Peyton, come on over here and sit down. I know you want to. It's OK. It's so simple, you know, because Peyton is fidgety. He got, you know, 
this and that. He's excited, but Thomas is just like, hey, come on over here now. You okay? <laughs> and Peyton will just chill. You know, it's like, man, but also getting to watch their craft, right? Um, I remember Thomas from Spike Lee films, you know. I know Carol just through her great craft of, of who she is as a queen, right? And to be in the in the like the creative presence, you know, it definitely gave me angst because I'm like, okay, cool, RJ, don't mess this up. <laughs> you know, like um, you in the face of legends, but chill, chill. You'll be one in, you know, some years, but who breathe. Um, and then to kind of see their character choices, it gave me a sense of me actually belonging there. It's like the family sense that I had created in, in Kitchum's mind, Carol and Thomas, they came to the table exactly with what I needed to then, you know, engage in the ways that I needed. But that's just the people that they are. They weren't acting like, you know, Caddy and, and, and Abner. They, those are the sweet people they are. Like, that's the protector she is. That's the protector he is. And, um, you know, I'm blessed to be able to actually share not even just their last, just even a film with them, you know, get to create in that space with them, be able to say, okay, cool. I actually was able to walk next to giants and I didn't mess it up or get, you know, stepped on, or I didn't, I didn't freak out and stuff like that, you know? So it's definitely a blessing and, and also something on my list of, of triumph, you know? Um, and hopefully when people see this movie, they see, not just their characters, but the people that they are to then further fall in love with them, you know. Well, they had exceptional performances in this movie. It's dedicated to them, I know, and I'm looking forward for everyone to see what they do as Caddy and Abner. Now, what do you hope viewers ultimately learn and take away from Freedom's Path as a whole film? I think from Freedom's Path, you know, uh, I want people to take a new, like refreshing taste of these events, if that makes sense. Usually when you see films like this, they make you pick a side. I think we need to start to create films that don't make you pick a side, but makes you start a conversation, you know, because in this film, you have two parties, right, who both do wrongs and both do rights in the film, you know. So it doesn't make you choose who's the who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, who's the this and that. It's like, nah. These are two sides where a lot of their decisions, right? If it wasn't person to person, right? They were just called by other people. Like William was just following orders. But when he got to meet somebody, right? From the other side, dang, I don't actually want to follow these orders. These, these people aren't like that, you know? Like it gives a different aesthetic of how people kind of outlook or paint this picture of the other party or the other side. It's like, dang, I like the thing of conjoining two parties that look nothing alike. They actually don't. I'm chocolatey and Garen is white chocolate, you know? And so in that time, you wouldn't think that love could be found between two individuals, you know, like especially of, of opposite races. And it's like, dang, this became my brother. So even when it comes to what people can relate to now, all of our friend groups are multicolored, you know? like everybody we we all have crayon boxes as our social groups <laughs> you know and thank you to social media for kind of opening that door you know so people can connect a little bit more so it's it's now like start to start the conversation that doesn't create division but one that creates understanding to then further move better as a society right because oppression is bad on either side you know what i'm saying but i think the division of what we have nowadays is we have films like this that make you either angry and or question the, the 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 thoughts of yourself i guess you can say like they only give you an uproar they don't actually make you ask a question and so for this film i just want people to start to ask a question and want to continue the conversation even if some of the answers or whatever or some of the topics may be a little off or shaking or makes us uncomfortable because it's nothing better than unlearning toxicity you feel me so in this realm, you know, we only felt like there were bad interactions between Black people and Caucasian people. And it wasn't. It was actually love shared between a lot of them. A lot of white people were killed for trying to save Black people, <laughs> you know? Like, these were events, but they don't show these stories, you know? They don't, they don't give these. So I think Freedom's Path is a good start to kicking those type of films off.
That was so well said. I can't add anything else to that, but I also did feel like there was this underlying theme of, you know, finding what you're personally fighting for. And like you kind of alluded to, not just following orders. And it's currently on the film festival circuit. Will you be at any of the premieres? Because I, I don't I, think you you have yet, but I've just been, been I know, I know that's so on me. I've been working trying to continue, you know, the good stuff, but I know we have a few coming up. Um uh, soon and before I start to to kick into this next project I'm gonna try to hit as many because me and Brett are really cool like together when we get to kind of party or whatever and Gary kind of brings you know he brings the the the, the calm energy like if anything me and Brett will get like detained for being very loud and childish in the Chuck E. Cheese but Gary will be the one that's like hey guys listen there was no alcohol involved they were excited it was whack-a-mole you know, like you let us know. I'm sure you look forward to reuniting with them when you can, but um, yeah. hopefully a wide release once you get the distribution all all sorted out. So well, that will end kind of the general conversation about the film, but now we will be discussing some spoilers. So to all those watching, please make sure you skip this part if you have not watched Freedom's Path in full yet. We'll include it in the YouTube chapters. So. Yeah, don't don't listen to this if you haven't seen the film because you need to watch it in full first. But for you, RJ, which was your favorite scene to be a part of and why? Um, favorite scene to be a part of. All right, well, there's a few. Um I think so the watering hole scene was right. That that was probably like that that had to be my favorite scene to shoot also because it also was my scariest scene to shoot while we were filming right and it was probably like two seconds before brett said rolling and i was already in fear of this of animals being in the water because we shot on location so we just had to deal with you know the the environment whatever whatever you give us we'll take it and so there was a dead black moccasin just floating <laughs> in the water that I was about to jump into, you know? And I said, no, at first I said, I said, you know what, let's just wait because it could be another coming downstream that may have some life still in it. And uh, <laughs> Brett was like, no, I promise it's good. And Chris said the same thing. I'm like, aha. And so it was definitely one of those like, all right, just trust the boys, but also, this is why women live longer than men type thing, you know? Because it's like, it showed me like, all right, man, look, you dedicated to this stuff, you know? Like, this is literally, RJ, this is good, you know? Um, and plus it was just a fun scene to shoot. Uh, and then also the the scene between me, Garen, also the kids kind of wrestling and joining. I don't know, I was just really, really happy that day for some reason, you know? Yeah. So with the kids, I was going to say it's um, Nia and Peyton, who, yeah. who star as uh, Nora and Sammy. Mm -hmm. So what was it like having these moments of joy and reprieve amongst everything else going on and kind of taking on that older brother role? It was good. I, I'm the youngest brother, you know, out of my family. I'm the youngest of three, right? So then to be kind of like the, the older brother of these two, like, golden hyper nuggets <laughs> i was like all right word because the energy that you seen while cameras were rolling were the same energy that you seen when they were off you feel me like and it was good because it's always refreshing i think that sometimes us as adults of course we get laggy on energy because we old or but they kind of were like the the five hour energy shots that you needed <laughs> when it's like three in the morning and you got a night shoot then you see just Peyton running across. He's like, okay, cool. If Peyton up, I'm up. No, because Peyton up, if Peyton up, I got to be up, you know, or me up, hey, I, I got to be up because the kids up and if the kids can do it, I got to do it, you know. Uh, but also they just fun, man. I used to work with kids a lot, just doing bar mitzvahs and stuff. And also I'm an uncle of like a bunch of little babies. I was going to so, say you're a new uncle, so you have lots of practice in the years to come. You know, it's really cool. I got two little new nuggets and it's so cool because my 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 first initial thought was like, holy crap, we got two new little ones. But this is the first time, you know, that 
excuse me, my fiance is actually an auntie, right? So it's like, oh snap, we the all oh, cool uncle and auntie couple. Like it's really good now. That's so great to hear. And I'm sure you two will be so great with these children as they continue to grow older. Now to talk about some other scenes, there was a bonfire scene, which I loved with all the um, free neighbors and family. Take me through kind of the atmosphere on set with the singing and the dancing. And it just felt like so warm and inviting. Yeah, it's, it's this. You ever been to like a church in the South? Yeah, man. It's almost, you think that you can't, like, uh, uh, I guess you could say visit heaven before you, you pass away, but you can, <laughs> you know. Um, I think just being on, on set and even in that scene, um, in those times, all they had were their voices, you know, to either praise and or wish for better. You know, we didn't have too many instruments. We had hides and then we had wood that we can make drums out of, you know, and to bring that energy, I guess you could say, to the set was kind of, it was it was really simple just because I used to play the drums, I'm a dancer, so these type of environments is for me, you know, but it's a different type of spirituality that came with just kind of being there. Of course it was cold, right? But when we were all gone and the, the extras that we shot with, the 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 energy that would just come at the click of a you know finger or whatever is it's just like amazing but also music does that to the spirit you know um to to kind of be a part of it i had to catch myself to not do too many you know new age things because it's like wait this is a period piece rj but i'm feeling good right now i got my jubilee slides on right <laughs> you know like let me get down but the energy was almost like just singing with your family because that's what we were like. And you didn't have to be a part of the same bloodline at that time to be considered family. You know, all you had to do was just share my, you you what? Come in, brother, let me take care of you as if you came straight from my mom. You know, let me take care of you, sis, as if you came straight from my mom. And that's the type of energy because everybody that was in the campfire scene, of course, even movie sense wise, they weren't all families. We were all groups of people that came into one group because we were oppressed by a different group, you know, but this is where we found our happy space. This is where we found our love that this is where we get to rejuvenate our spirit man's, you know, and it's all, it's literally the example of how God determines, you know, or defines, excuse me, the Bible or, or the church in the Bible. It's like, it comes from us. The church is literally in the human being and we didn't have a church in this scene. We were literally outside up under the stars. It was definitely cold, but we got a few little, you know, warm jets out there. So we good. And um, it, it gave that. I, I love it. We didn't even use a speaker and things of that nature. We literally used our voices for that scene. We couldn't afford to use a speaker as a part of the project. <laughs> but it, it, that's what made it pure. That's what made it like so great. That's what made it so tasteful you know, to just be in that energy of everybody wanting to to, to put out the greatest um, art that could represent this time, you feel me? Because this group of people exists. So we want to do them justice as well as we do in our bloodline and our culture. And you could feel really that soul come out of the screen when I was watching it. And to talk about music, um, harmonica and kitsch, uh, did you really enjoy that aspect? Oh yeah, I'm an old soul. Like I know I'm only 27, but I promise I was born in like the 30s. <laughs> you know, uh, I was I was definitely when um, when I read that kids uh, played the harmonica, I called my dad and was like, "Papa, I get to play the harmonica in this." And he was like, "The harmonica? Wait, this? How old are you in this movie?" I was like, "Daddy, I'm just a teenager, but it's an old school movie." He was like, "All right now," because I'm a you know I'm a musician and I'm more of like a a buddy guy type of like in jazz swing, you know, I'm, you know, uh, Osley Brothers, that's that's my type of vibe when it comes to music. So then Kitchen with the soul that he played the harmonica with, you know, it's almost like his second language. Kitchen don't speak, you know, Spanish, uh, Chinese, uh, Korean, he doesn't speak Mandarin, none of these, he doesn't speak um, English too well, he speak country. But he does know how to speak tone. He is a melodic creature, you feel me? And that's that's a beautiful thing that I, I 
I was given the permission to go fully to when it came to Brett. Like Brett even let me put together a playlist and you know give Kitchen that that you feel me and yeah I can still play it now. <laughs> Take it out at the the next party. You'll yeah, just take yeah. out the harmonica instead. It looks like you're going to be doing the DJ work, but you have a harmonica. Hey, uh, look, it's nice to stop. keep it up, right? Yeah, because it's yeah. it's like another skill, another craft, and you don't want to lose it. Uh, I want to talk about a more difficult scene when Kitchum is responding to William saying that there was some good to come out of slavery and how it shaped him. He had to detail the trauma and abuse that he suffered. Tell me about getting into that that headspace for that dialogue. So that, that headspace, and Brett will tell you, that was one scene that actually was really scary to shoot uh, for me because I felt like, even though we have a uh, company around us and everybody is definitely there for me, um, <clears throat> the things that I kind of needed to remind myself of to go there for that scene, I hadn't went through the healing process to deal with those yet, you feel me? And it was really scary because I didn't recognize that that's what I was going to pull from. You know, it's, it's almost like the spontaneity of the mind said, hey, I need to go here if you want to feel this. But I didn't give it permission. <laughs> um, and and Brett wanted to, I know he wanted to, to shoot it after we had shot that scene. But just to make it through that scene took so much. And then even when I got home, I didn't turn on any, any TV or music or anything like that. I just like, I had to sit, you know, for a little bit um, and then start to do the, the, the identifying process of like, okay, RJ, you good? Because you still really messed up right now. And um, the only thing that kind of made me safe in that in that time was my director and Garen. Like I didn't, everybody else around like were, were you know, it didn't really matter. But if I didn't have them to, to kind of, hey, bro, you good. RJ, you good. You good. Whatever you need, we got you. If you need 10, 5, 20, to such and such. But I'm, I'm understanding that we need to get this shot, you know, so it was definitely reckless. It's like a, it looked like a snow globe <laughs> and, you know, somebody shook it up in my mind. I'm just like, dang, every, every word out of my mouth was almost like a, uh, you know, it was, it was really painful to get through that type of monologue when it's, it's kind of pouring from a place that you didn't recognize was still in there from a, a hurtful standpoint. So it's like, dang, uh, can I take a break? No, you can't take a break because, uh, you know, time is kind of money right now and we ain't get a lot. So, <laughs> you know, being able to kind of who just for those hours was, you know, triumphant enough. But that was a very, very tough scene to shoot. And even we tried to reshoot and I was like, bro, I can't even I can't even bro. I'm scared to go there. You feel me? Um, because the last time that I went there, Papa, I was down for the whole weekend, you know, um, and for him as a director to understand where I was coming from. That's also what made me lock in with Brett for everything future tense that he has, because he paid attention to my my mental, I guess you could say, state uh, at that time, and he didn't want to take me back there. You know, he was like, "Oh, of course we we need this or such and such by what they say, but if you feel like it's gonna really ruin you to go back to this scene, RJ, we actually got it. Like you don't have to, <laughs> you know." And I was like, "Thank you," because I actually would have been horrified to do it again because it took a lot for me to get it right the first time. You know, it's like, this took everything out of me, y'all. <laughs> but, you know, he deserves it, man. He deserves it. Have you seen that? Have you watched that scene back in the oh, final yeah. cut? Okay. Oh, yeah. I cried. This movie is like, I cry like a baby. If you want to ever see me cry, just watch Freedom's Path with All me. Right. <laughs> Our day's going to sit in the theater and you'll just be looking over. You won't even be watching it because you'll just be in tears the whole yeah. movie. It was so emotional, but you know, you did such a good job with this character. And then the scene with Garen when he realizes that William's Kitch realizes that William's been lying about his position um, in the army, his situation. Take me through those emotions of betrayal. And like, I know it was slightly, it was still kind of dark a place of anger maybe less so than your own a monologue but still something really heavy on his heart yeah I think with that like 
betrayal, yes, is something that every human being goes through. And I had definitely been betrayed by, you know, one of my closest friends and things of that nature. And even one of the friends that I felt like, oh, I was betrayed by, right? It wasn't even a thing of betrayal. It's like they were in the same spot of mental vulnerability and also turmoil as I was. So the choosing factor could be disturbed, you know, but now he's like, we back tight because we recognized, okay, at the time I was going through this, my bad for not hearing you, bro. You feel me? Hey, my bad, I was going through this. And so my bad for not hearing you. It's like, we both had to say the same things to each other just because my capacity of what I could hold down and, you know, how I treat people or my loyalty, such and such was different. Doesn't mean that I wasn't in the same way of fault in some ways, you know what I'm saying? Cause I wasn't listening to my brother, you know? So he was definitely warranted because if I was listening, I would have known what he was going through at the time. You feel me? But I've also been in the space to where it's just actually malicious towards RJ, you know, like, or being used or being stolen from a lie to and such. So when it came to this scene, I was like, we got to give it a balance. Because what we don't do <laughs> is just go off like we would, you know, like we want. We don't kill William. We do not kill William, which is what you would think would happen in that moment. Because then I don't know if I can trust you, you know. And now I have my brother and my sister with me. And you are now, I might have to kill you, you know. Uh, but to then give him the chance of redemption in ways, you know, like. The same day Kitch was hurt was the same day that he was forgiven, you know, in this way of whip. He's like, bro, I forgive you, dog. I want to fight for you, you know. And even just that that type of <clears throat> that type of like forgiveness is kind of where we were meant to be as humans, you know, like because we can sustain certain things doesn't mean we should have to, but also it's nothing like holding on to hurt that kind of can stop you from your next blessing. And so that's why I feel like the even just the message of portrayal in here, but I still go to the grave for you. You know what I'm saying? It's very important in this movie because what are our most most of our worst heartbreaks happen with people that's closest to us because they know how to do these things, or it's like their their feelings or their words actually affect us. Like we really we actually care, but people lie to us on a day to day basis. People still, you know. We have big corporations steal from us every day. Our own government do it sometimes. But it's like we don't expect different from them. When it comes to people that we're close to, we expect for them to treat us different. I expect for you to look out for me. I expect for you to love me. I expect for you to do right by me. But we're human. So sometimes we don't know what doing right by you might look like in this situation. You know, like we might, we might mess this up. But are you still going to love me at the I word? Cool. I'll do better next time. You're not going to see this again, but thank you for letting me know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, I, I won't spoil the ending, but I will say it's a gritty and powerful film. Uh, so excited again for people to see it at Freedom's Path Film on Instagram for updates on when to catch it and when they have their wide release. Now, moving on to some other projects. I love how you put so much energy and passion into them. You've said before each project that you do could be the last. And you did face homelessness, financial struggles when your family first moved to California. How have they supported your career and really contributed to your work ethic as an artist? My every film that I have come out, right? My parents, it's um they get um a theater down in Jacksonville, Florida. It's like they'll just buy a a, a whole bunch of tickets and then just invite people to watch it, you know. Um, and that's been every single film since me and Earl. Um, they'll do it in, in Jacksonville, even when they were living with me in California, they would uh tap in with my grandpa back home, make sure that the city can see it, you know, and that's been since the beginning, but also just them kind of giving me uh, peace because they recognize that I'm out here now by myself. So sometimes when I need to call back, it's because they know RJ better than RJ would know me in certain ways. And also uh, they recognize that this industry sometimes can move a little fast. So if I do got a question, I'll be like, hey, y'all, okay, cool. So uh, business say this, but faith say this, <laughs> you know? And faith always win, but sometimes I'll, I'll be like, well, uh, but the business that sounded, he's like, all right, well, word. 
Well, um, now it's up to you, RJ. No, I don't know what that means. RJ, either choose faith or you choose the business sense. And sometimes you need to choose the business sense because your faith can be supported by such. And But these are nuggets that my parents drop. You know, like, what? What? Or even like times when I didn't have, you know, uh, the, the booking cash or whatever such. Like during the time of us going homeless, like I definitely had a job doing bar mitzvahs, but I couldn't pay nothing with that with that type of money. It's expensive to live in California. <laughs> it's so expensive. So it's like, dang, I still ain't got enough to do nothing. Okay, cool. And me and Earl and the Dying Girl was the first movie that got us out of that type of situation, you know. Um, and I, I made a promise to myself, I'll never let them see that type of struggle. Uh and, and, and like, yeah, I don't man, definitely a kick root part to why I go so hard about what I do. I, I like to hear that, you know, they play such an important part in your life and continue to do so as you have more projects in your resume. So me and Earl and the Dying Girl, it's been seven years since it's come out, which is crazy. Uh, what kind of memories do you have from making that film? Like, which was your all-time favorite scene in this movie? Uh, favorite scene in me and Earl had to be the haircut scene between uh, with Olivia um, well, not the haircut scene, but just that that uh, when she when she actually lost her hair, right? Because we all helped Olivia, you know, to to cut her hair and stuff like that. And to me, that was a very special moment, even another level of respect for the craft that I had. Like Olivia Cook definitely opened my eyes in so many different ways to the importance of what we do. You feel me? And also how we assist each other in doing that because a uh, piece of this character required for her friends to have, you know, this 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 understanding, but a part of Olivia required for her castmates to understand, you know, this part. And so for me um, to recognize that the, the, the hair of a woman is like a part of her identity and beauty from you know, from birth, you know, long, pretty hair, men, you know, we, this is how ours grow. So, <laughs> but for, for that, you know, uh, to take that step and to take that chance to be like, I'm not just going to attach my beauty to my hair or to what society may put as what makes a woman beautiful, right? That took such like courage to me, like the, the, Olivia Cook is one of the most like, headstrong, but also just mentally prepared and also just like bossy ass, excuse my French, people that I know, like she blew my mind. I've never seen, you know, somebody actually take that charge in their craft. Like there was no other reason outside were, you know, for her to do it other than the fact that she wanted this character to not just be a good character, but to mean something to the people who've seen her, you know, and the the artistry of RJ doubled by 10 because I got to watch how Olivia Cook approached and attacked this role and also gave to this role. You know, it's like boom, boom tastic, <laughs> you know. And then with Thomas, holy crap, you know, I remember the uh like my headphone days were given to that tip is given to me by Thomas Mann, you know. Um really, really he had to settle down in a space of sorrow and sadness right he had to be very low in this movie in some points and for me to kind of watch thomas turn from bubble hey guy you know what's up we used to go around pittsburgh and hang out all the time from meat and potatoes all the way to the pierogies at the baseball game you know like it was great and to see like uh greg come from thomas right you wouldn't notice that they're the same people you know because you know thomas from project x and like Kong, and then you look at who he created in in Earl, and I mean in me and Earl, and it's like, wow, Greg was a whole different type of savage, you know, like, and 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 it's also just fun working with them too in general because they don't allow for the boring nostalgia of life. They actually want to kick it up by ten, <laughs> so that was good. Definitely my homies for life, and Olivia Cook saved my life before, so yeah. 
I really hope that you get to work with Thomas and Olivia again at some point. I know you all are doing, like I mentioned before, this interview so well. I think he just had a film released um, about fate. She's in House of the Dragon. Yeah. You have your, your TV show season two rap shit as well. Um, another project you were a part of, of course, Power Rangers. To this mm -hmm. day, there are still people asking for a sequel with that 2017 cast. Yeah. Now, yeah. to to play Billy, a black superhero on the spectrum, how has this role impacted you both personally and professionally? Billy, he he opened a lot of doors for me to uh, not just reach certain people or touch certain people because I love to just meet and also be able to engage um, with people's inner person. You, you feel me? Because the shell is born. The shell is who we have to put on to exist with each other. Um, but Billy required a vulnerability that was kind of outside of RJ. You know, um, my friend Andre, who I was in band with when I was in high school, that's who Billy was created um, off of. Like, I just took on the energy that Andre made me feel when I was around him. How did he hug me when he was around? How pure was his words? You know, how how much did he have to say at these times or how much did he have to say at they, those times? What is what does he do when he's nervous? What does he do when he's calm? What does he do, you know, and I put it into a, a place of like, I didn't want to be offensive, you know? I wanted to be understood that I'm a human being and I communicate different, you feel me? I'm not different, I just communicate different. I communicate from a more pure place without all of these filters of acceptance and or appropriation that we all have to, you know, kind of like, I just don't have the same social cues and knowledge and structures you do, but everything that I say, <laughs> You can count on it. I don't, it makes it good because I don't even know how to lie. You know, like Billy literally is the honest one. You know, and it's like, I, I actually have no idea how to, how to do that. I thought all humans just told you what's up, <laughs> you know? And then just to see how he impacted people um, of, 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 you know, just the community that are on the autistic spectrum, like, and to hear how they, uh, took it because I don't I don't care how RJ feel about it. It's not about me. You feel me? Who am I representing in this role? And to hear them that that's that's literally the most anxiety written couple months that I had waiting until the movie came out because I'm like the people that I'm representing. I want them to understand it. I want them to accept it. I want it to be loved by them. I want it to be checked off by them. Okay, this is good, RJ. And it's not because, oh, well, I feel like my acting is so good. No, it's because I'm representing a group of people, you know? So I'll be, I'll be an old lady's uncle before I'm, you know, I let that down, you know? And uh, luckily, he turned out so good. <laughs> He really did. And to, it must be such a gift to know the impact that it's had, even on like your co-star Becky and I know her brother, Alex, um, she's talked yeah. about it in the past. Now about that sequel, do you think you've aged out of playing a high school student? Oh, no. Oh, so what only ages me, right, is these 15 chin hairs. It was 12 last week. I got 15 now and my hair, but I still look like a kid. Like I don't like I get tested for like um, I guess you could say my patience almost every time I go out somewhere because it's like my idea get checked, right? But then they have to double check it. And it's like, bro, it only say 27. It don't say 30 some, you know, it don't say nothing outside. Of, I literally look 27, <laughs> but I don't think so. So I can I mean, see a wrong. <laughs> you would come back in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. What message do you have for the fans who have stuck by you and your career? Because I know that you also were at a convention, the Power Morphicon in August. So you got to meet some fans there as well, who I'm sure yeah. were also saying, you know, where was the sequel? Where did it go? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, first, let me give gratitude to each and every like nugget of mine. I wouldn't even just say fan because my supporters mean so much more than just like the fandom thing, right? Um, I love you guys. I really appreciate y'all. I'm so sorry that I don't, I'm not good at like communicating. I'm a little like socially awkward. So sometimes I'll be on Instagram or I miss something or sometimes I'm on Twitter and I miss something. It's like, I'm so sorry, but I really do appreciate and I love each and every one of them. And I got so much heat coming. 
oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's only, it's only the beginning. Um, I got a lot of stuff coming for, you know, my supporters, not just uh, like movies and stuff, but like meetups, I got concerts, I got, you know, things of that nature, DJ tours. So yeah, my, 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 my support is definitely about to start to feel the, the, the benefits of just keeping me whole and keeping me going. They always push me, but they also, sometimes they'll tell when I'm like off and be like, Hey, smile a little bit more like okay you don't have to do that but i get it it's because you know me <laughs> you know so yeah shout out to nugget nation man i was curious because in the movie it teased the green ranger in if they did a sequel was there ever any conversation at that time on who might be cast or did you have any you know ideas of of who could be tommy oliver no, I didn't. I, I literally had no idea. I was like, okay, cool. I didn't even know this was a part of the part of the ending. <laughs> but uh, they snuck but it, it in there when you guys yeah. had no idea. Yeah, they, they were like, we have different concepts for the future. I was like, word, but we never made it to that point to know what that was. You know, they kind of just released the movie, let the movie go. <laughs> Well, I still I still thought it was a great kind of adaptation of, of the Power Rangers and you still are tagged in fan art. So it must be nice to, to still see that everlasting impact. Okay. Um, now we are going to play a game called Throwback Trivia. How it works is I'm going to be asking you questions that you've been asked in past interviews or related to your own social media and career. And it's basically a test of your memory. So it's out of nine. We'll see how well you do. Are you ready? Woo! I might be. Teen Vogue 2018 in a rom-com about your life. What song would you have playing so you did give a couple options so i will take either the song title or the artists mm, i know it's some ishdar in there um uh, hmm. dang it's so many it's it's a lot because now my soundtrack to life has changed it's changed so much it's <laughs> Who did RJ listen to in 2018? I listened to, or 2018, I know I listened to, to Ishdar. I know I was on some Kevin Gates in, 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 in that time. Um, Osley Brothers at that time. I was on some Sage the Gemini at that time a lot. Uh, who else? J. Cole was at that time for me. Okay, mm. there we go. J. Cole. I was waiting for you <laughs> to say, okay, you got the point. You did say K.O.D. by J. Cole, or you said Stargazing, Travis Scott. Oh, Travis, World. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. so J. Cole, good. New York Moves Magazine in 2018. If there was one item that you could take on stage that would crack everyone up, what would it be? It was a car, so I will take either the model that you gave or the brand name. Is it a Daewoo? Wait, you said that'll crack everybody up, like make them laugh? Yeah. I don't know where the, the question came from, but yeah, I think I think to make people laugh, I would have pulled up in like a Prius or a Daewoo. But you said you got it Prius. You said Prius. Yeah. Cause I know that me being that big in a Prius <laughs> and or a Daewoo, that would trip people out. You have a good memory. You you are thinking the same. Okay, Interview Magazine in 2017, you said your retirement plan was to move to what city? Oh, Pittsburgh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, interview with Hey You Guys in 2015 to promote me and Earl. Yourself, Thomas, and Olivia voted you as most likely to have your own reality show. What did you say it might be called? Damn. Ew. I'll give you a hint. It was Chipotle something. Oh, I was addicted to Chipotle at that time. Um, damn. You got me there because I can't remember what the last word would be because everything that I would say now is just so inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is rehab. 
Chipotle, oh, Chipotle. rehab. Oh, oh yeah. So you take was... the L on this one, but you're still yeah. doing pretty good. You still have three. Okay. In 2013, this is out of two. You sang and rapped on two original songs with your friend Joe Moore. What were they titled? Um, um, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube, Joe. Ooh, I, can I call in a, a, a hotline? <laughs> um, I'll give you a hint for one of them. I can't, one of them is one word and one of them is don't drop the blank. Oh, don't drop the soap is one of them. <laughs> and that was a, that's a, it's a nice little groove to it. Um, and then, um, don't drop the soap. Um, um, damn. You said it's you can one take word. the loss. It is one word. <laughs> it's one word. Um, dang, you probably get. I'm me. gonna give it to you. It's it's robbery. That was the second. Oh, one. word! It was that. Holy sh! Did dang. you think about that in your head? <laughs> yeah, I did. I didn't even think about that song because it's so horrible. Like <laughs> it's literally the worst shit to rap about. Well, you did it, and it, it's out there, oh. but it's all part of the history. Um, okay, thing. you have uh, one more, and there, there's it's out of three, so you have a chance to, to make some points up here. You have three Instagram story highlights. What are they? Uh, Roland, DJ Free, my babies, I think, right? You got Roland, DJ Free, and the other one is not. It's not my babies. Uh, um, uh, damn. Oh, 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 wait, no, that's not it. Uh, <laughs> that's on a whole nother app. Um, dang, what is it? You're like, I haven't been on my Instagram profile recently. Yeah, it's it I told you I'm leaps. bad at it. It's leaps. Leaps. Oh, yeah, because I was jumping and doing uh, like. <laughs> healthy stuff at that time you were like damn so you got six out of nine which is not bad i have to oh, say man. it's pretty good your memory's still there yeah it's, it's it, i'm not too like old yet so I'm, <laughs> I'm older but i'm not old yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, one more question. Um, well, two more questions. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about music, your passion for music. You DJ, you play piano, drums. How did music enter your life? And tell me about the role it plays today, because you just mentioned that you have a lot of things upcoming on that front as well. Yeah, um, I was given music by my papa. Uh, my dad used to have one of the big tombstone record players in my house, and he used to be a DJ himself. So um, a lot of uh, what I know about music, my pa passed to me, and then I was kind of able to uh, branch out by myself. But I remember he used to, uh, Saturdays before anybody would wake up, you would hear the radio system in the garage, you know, and it was good and it was cool because it wouldn't always be stuff that I knew, but it was stuff that I would use in my now day of music. And so... After that, we would watch like Amadeus on CW17 and then um, kind of stretch the rest of the day just kind of listening to music and such. And then I started to play the drums. Uh, my godmama, Christina, she taught me and she's like the rawest drummer that I know. And I know a lot of drummers, you know, and it's great. They're great. But my godmama still holds the championship for best drum in the world because she first she taught me how to play the drums even from just a simple one two four count to pair of diddles and craziness with my feet you know and <clears throat> then um i started to get into djing a lot more just because i was dancing and the stuff that i was dancing to at parties it was like okay this is actually bad but if you put this with that that'll actually be good you know or just going out and to you know, younger parties in like middle school and high school and hearing just DJs just be, oh gosh, it would be so bad. Uh, <laughs> and then I started to do my own thing on virtual DJ when I first heard about it. And I did parties off of the computer. You know, we used to take the whole two piece, the monitor and the CPU, take it to whoever house and we'll play it like that. And then um, 
I started making music with my god mom. So she's like the highway to multiple versions, if not almost every version of musical, uh, I guess you could say knowledge that I have, because from recording to uh, playing to fixing, my god mama taught me these things because her as just a, a audio type of box in herself, she's crazy. And then I started making music with her uh, and first song we made was this this song called Gifts Within, which was kind of it's kind of cool because it was like young baby RJ voice real high, you know, oh my god, mama. And uh, then I started to, of course, live life and experience more. So now, you know, my music it doesn't uh, mimic or or kind of, I guess you could say, match a certain genre because it's all like a lot of thoughts in my head um, and things of that nature, but they come from somewhere. It's like, I'm I'm a, to a storyteller rather than uh, just a rapper or a singer or what I like to tell stories. I'm more like a poet. They got a beat behind them and he know how to follow that beat, you know? <laughs> it's so nice to kind of look back and have these memories, like you mentioned um, with your grandmother and you said DJ tour. I mean, yeah. that sounds exciting. Are you kind yeah, of like yeah. looking into venue options, maybe cities you want to play in? Yeah, we are. So me and my me and some of my uh, co-stars from White Boy Rick, we putting together a little situation, and um, off of that, after that, I'm gonna try to kick into the same cities, you know, for DJing. But I mostly want to do a DJ tour to tour with my brother Broderick. Um, because he's a, he's a great DJ, one of the biggest in my city now. And he started as a nobody DJ, you know? And so it's mostly just to, to kind of work with my brother again, because we used to have a dance group together, but then when I moved, um, you know, we just didn't get to be uh, together again like that. And so to just do a DJ tour with my brother, that's like on my bucket list. And I'm like, why not do it? I can make it happen by myself. I don't have to wait for anybody, to, you know, to do these things. And, and yeah, that's like a, a dream of mine is to be able to tour with Broderick and, and, and I guess you could say make an impact, you know, DJ Crash and DJ Free, man, like just making it happen. Yeah, and it's so fun to do it with, with your family, people you know, obviously. I have yeah. our signature question for you. If you could be any ice cream flavor, which would you be and why? Cookies and cream because that's me and my fiance's favorite color. I mean, color, flavor. And the colors, I have shoes that are just like that. And I'm a shoe dude. So, like, but also, I just really love cookies and cream. It gives you the same, like, it gives you both. It gives you vanilla and it gives you chocolate, but you don't have to choose. You feel me? Or you don't have to get the weird cosmopolitan with the little odd ah, strawberry at the end. Like, you could just get what you want. <laughs> get what you want so yeah i'm a good cookies and cream you know i love it that's a perfect way to end things off rj thank you so much for taking the time to chat it's been so much fun and so insightful as well of course thank you so much make sure to catch rj in freedom's path again at freedom's path film on instagram for updates a lot of new things in the work including music and we will see you next time oh yeah